Tonight we shall study biblical separation, personal and ecclesiastical, that is at church level. And the text is Romans 16, verse 17 to verse 20. Please allow me to read to you from God's Word before we continue. Romans 16, verse 17 to verse 20. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. For your obedience is come abroad unto all men. I am glad therefore on your behalf, but yet I would have you wise unto that which is good, and simple concerning evil. And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. May God bless us in the reading of his most holy and sacred word. What is a Christian? Not who is a Christian. What in your own eye is a Christian? From God's perspective, a Christian is a child of God whom he could have taken them to glory the moment they accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and as Saviour. But he decided not to do so in almost every case. For some, he will allow you to live for a few hours, some maybe a few days, some a few weeks, but many of us will be years. And so what is a Christian to us is very important. Did God leave it to us to define for ourselves what we ought to be after he has saved us and left us behind? The Bible tells us that God gave us prophets, apostles, evangelists, pastors, teachers in order to help us grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, to serve him effectively. But the most important thing is that we will become more and more like the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, what is a Christian from God's perspective, especially for those who are left behind after salvation, is that you are to be the mouthpiece of Christ. You speak my words, Jesus says. When they look at your life, your behavior, your conduct, your dressing, everything about you, they must no longer see you. You are now in Christ. It's like something that you have put inside a box. You don't see what is inside the box, you see what is the box. And so if we are in Christ and Christ is in us by means of the Holy Spirit, and since we are in Christ, Jesus says, I want them to see Christ only in your life. I don't want them to see you anymore because now I want you to go out and tell them you are a Christian. And the starting point after your salvation is you must now be baptized to tell your loved ones and your friends who know you before you were converted that from now onwards you are a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Saviour. And from now onwards, you're going to see the Lord Jesus Christ by my new life. My behavior will be changed. My morality and my ethics will now be Bible-based. It will be Christ-centered. My mind is now the mind of Christ. God has given to me the love of God or the love of Christ in my heart as my new motive. So what is a Christian from God's perspective? These are the description that God has given to us. That means, if anyone who calls himself a Christian does not live a life that is reflective of the image of Jesus Christ, of the Jesus that is according to Scripture, should you keep quiet, turn a blind eye as if you didn't hear anything or see anything. So, for example, if your colleague in your workplace call himself a Christian, doesn't matter whether he's really born again or not, it doesn't matter. The moment he called himself a Christian, the image of Christ is now on him. He swears during meetings. 
You go out with lunch with him. He cracks dirty jokes. He used vulgar words. He called himself a Christian. So should you just simply leave things be and maintain some degree of peace? Or should you speak up, pull him aside and tell him, you said that you are a Christian. Do you know that Christians do not use vulgarity? Do you know that Christians have Christian morals and ethics that are Bible-based? Do you know that Christians do not do this and do not do that? Because the moment you do that, you are practicing biblical separation. Do you know that? And so now you want to draw a line and tell him that what you are doing is wrong. You have to let him know. Because that person is hurting the image of Christ that you also bear. He has basically presented a false Christ to all the other colleagues because you are trying to present to them the Christ of the Bible. And he's making it almost impossible for you because everything that you try to tell them that is according to Scripture, this colleague of yours is undoing it. So you have no choice unless you disobey your Saviour. You do not want to defend his honour. For whatever reason, it is a transgression. That's why the question before we look at this issue of biblical separation is, what is a Christian to you? Not who. What is a Christian? Did God leave it to us to decide and define for ourselves? Because if that is, then let us all mind our own business. You define Christ this way, I define Christ this way, even though both are opposites. You think God would do that to his only begotten son? The only name under heaven that can save a sinner out of hell, that can deliver him from the bondage of sin, to remove from his life the penalty of sin which is death and hell, and give him the strength and courage to overcome the dominion of sin and to take away the guilt of sin because God has pardoned him in Christ. And you think God would allow any one of us to make a mess of the name of Jesus Christ and get away with it. And you think God will welcome you into his kingdom if you were to do that? You think Jesus Christ will receive you with open arms and say, well done, my good and faithful servant? Then you keep quiet knowing his name has been so badly marred, distorted by this person's behavior and conduct. Biblical separation is like the white blood cells. That is the first line of defense in our body. You have a very weakened immunity. Your white blood cells are basically sleeping on non-existence. That is an illness, a name for it, isn't it? You have no more protection, no more immunity. You're deficient. Biblical separation is the first line of defense that the Lord has given to us to protect the holy image that is in you if you are born again. If you're not born again, then you are a very dangerous person to the cause of Christ. Because you keep calling yourself a Christian, but you can't live the life of a Christian because living the life of a Christian is the work of the Holy Spirit. And biblical separation is the first defense that the Lord says that every child of God must maintain, observe everywhere you go. Are you prepared to do that? If you are not prepared to do that, it's better that you don't call yourself a Christian, actually. When someone commits adultery, when a sinner commits adultery, he commits adultery. That's it. He walks around, his wife knows that's an adulterer. That's it. His name will now be equal an adulterer. When a Christian commits adultery, his name is Jesus Christ. Oh, you mean Christians commit adultery? Christ commits adultery. Do you know that? That's a Christian. 
Do you understand our responsibility before God and Christ is to protect His name in our own lives first and then in the lives of others that you are aware of? And that's exactly what this text is. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them. The word mark them is where we get the English word scope. You know telescope? That's scope. That means scope that person. You know sometimes when you draw a picture of someone holding a high-powered rifle aiming at a target, what do you do? You have a circle and then you have a cross on it, right? And then you see this thing move to see where this person is going to target. Is it going to be this deer? Or is it going to be this buffalo? Or is it going to be this tree trunk? You see this target moving, scope, that's it. The Apostle Paul says, I beseech you. I know it is not something that I want to command you. It is something that I want to plead with you. Because if it is not based upon a beseeching, pleading, the danger is you become very legalistic. You become very high-minded. You become someone who put yourself on a pedestal, looking down on everybody, and you become very pharisaical. You judge this person, judge that person. That's the danger of wrong understanding and application of biblical separation. Over-judgmental, pharisaical, legalistic. And that we have to guard ourselves against. That's why the Apostle Paul says, I beseech you, brethren, do this with the right heart, the right motive. And then when you go on, which cause, mark them, which cause divisions and offences contrary to the doctrine which you have learned and avoid them. You know, the book of Romans is a very strange epistle. Do you know why? The first few chapters, it's normal. First eight chapters, the Apostle Paul explained what the gospel is all about. Many wonderful chapters explaining we all begin with sin. We all must have faith because we all are in the same boat, under the same God. We need the same way of salvation like Abraham by faith. And then after you are born again, positionally, you are always a child of God, no longer under bondage to sin, which was your old master. Now you are under the bondage of God that is righteousness. This is your new master. And then from a practical standpoint, you struggle against sin. That's chapter 7. And chapter 8 is the climax of our salvation. You can never lose your salvation because of the love of God that has been shed abroad in our hearts. We have the Holy Spirit and nothing can ever separate us from God in Christ Jesus, the love of God, Romans 8. Chapters 9, 10 and 11, he spent it on explaining how we need to be witnesses replacing the Old Testament national witness. Chapter 12 onwards, he explained how to do it. Make sure that you protect your own spiritual life. Don't become a casualty while you serve the Lord. Make sure that spiritually you are stable and strong before you begin to serve because you're going to be targeted by the devil. And then begin to teach us how to do that. And then when you look at the final verses like chapter 16 of Romans, you see something that is strange because the epistle is supposed to be completed in the last part of chapter 15. Now the God of peace be with you all. Amen. Isn't that the benediction already? Then why is there chapter 16 where he listed out all the names of the individual? Because in other epistles that Paul wrote, he will put all the names of the people, you know, greet this person for me, greet that person for me, and then he give the benediction and that's the end. But in this case, he had the benediction in the last part of chapter 15, and then he mentioned the names of all these people right up to verse 16, and then he talks about biblical separation, mark them from verse 17 to verse 20, and at the end of verse 20, there seems to be another benediction. And then he talks about another group of people, his co-laborers, Timotheus, my fellow workers, and Lucius, and Jason, and Sosipater, my kinsmen, salute you. And so these are the greeters who are with him. And then he ends it again in chapter 20, uh, verse 24 with another benediction. And then he talks about again in verse 25. And then he ends it in 27 with another benediction, a series of benedictions. This is unusual. The amazing thing is, why did he put the teaching on biblical separation 
from verse 17 to verse 20 after he listed out all these individuals. That means when you talk about marking them, he's not marking unbelievers. He's talking about marking believers, in other words. Scope those who are professing believers because they do the greatest damage to the cause of Christ. People who call themselves believers who are not truly born again, they do the greatest damage and that's why you have to mark them. And that is the challenge, isn't it? I don't mind marking and highlighting people like Billy Graham. I don't know him from Adam. Of course, he's dead already. Total strangers from outside who call themselves Christians, I can easily mention their name, mark them, and I'm sure you're not going to be offended because these are strangers to you. But the moment I mark someone whom you know, whom you like, whom you appreciate, that's going to be a different story, isn't it? Why? Why is it that when I mark a total stranger with an erroneous doctrine, you didn't bother? You say even you may even say amen. You agree. But the moment I mark, it's the same doctrine or something doctrinal but similar. Someone that you know, you get upset with me. Why? Why is that the case? Have you forgotten what is a Christian? Is Christianity just a matter of convenience? It is not a matter of your life, your very fabric of your being, your existence. Where you are left behind to tell people about Christ, to let Jesus Christ see your life. And now someone that is dear to you, someone that may have helped you, someone that may be related to you, someone that you may even call your son, your mom, your dad, your daughter. That's a different story. Why? Why should it be? Should it not be the same? Should that not even be more so? Don't you really, don't you really love them? By their error, they are misrepresenting Christ. Do you not love Christ? And if you take his side, are you not condoning what he's doing? Are you not even a partaker of his transgression? By encouraging him, knowing that he is holding on and pro propagating a wrong doctrine. That's why the apostle Paul says, you have to mark them. And because it is in the present tense, you're going to keep doing it. The moment you see someone, you're going to mark them. What should you mark? Those who cause divisions, those who cause offenses, that is the word scandalize. Contrary to the doctrines, that is the Bible, which you have learned, and then you avoid them, have nothing to do with them. That is the manner of separation that the Lord demands. And before Paul talked about this, he demonstrated it. You turn with me, please, to 1 Timothy chapter 1. You know that these pastoral epistles, 1 and 2 Timothy, were written by the Apostle Paul at the tail end of his ministry while he was in prison. So 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 18 to verse 20. This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, the spiritual son, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience, which some having put away concerning faith have made shipwreck, of whom is Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. You think the friends and the relatives of Alexander and Hymenaeus would be upset with Paul? Should they go around and castigate the Apostle Paul for mentioning the names of their friends or relatives or dad or brother? Should the wives and the children of Hymenaeus and Alexander take their father's side and go against the Apostle Paul? If they were believers. If they're not believers, understandable. They don't understand. Their mind is blind. Their mind is dead in sin. 
But you understand, you know what Paul did here is for their good. Hymenaeus and Alexander's good. They are in very, very devious transgression. But what they are doing cause shipwreck to others. You know what that means, right? They are stumbled, their faith is scandalized, what the Apostle Paul meant earlier, offenses contrary to the doctrine that is in the Scriptures. And so Paul had to single them out so that everyone would know. You and I also know them, you see, because it's recorded in the Scripture to let us know in order to scope someone, to mark someone, you have to mention name. If you don't mention any name, how are you going to scope someone? You talk in generalities. And then this person is the one that you are actually marking, but you don't mention his name, and so you associate yourself with him, you continue to fellowship with him, you invite him over to your home for meals, and you continue to say what he needs to say to stumble you. And because the pastor did not mark them by mentioning their name, he will now be held accountable. So will all of us, if you know someone. Now, of course, if you counsel him, he repented of his erroneous doctrine, that's fine. But these two individuals did not. They caused the faith of some to shipwreck. The Apostle Paul mentioned them again in 2 Timothy 2, verse 15 to verse 18. 2 Timothy 2. Study to show thyself a proof unto God. 2 Timothy 2, 15 to 18. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, that rightly dividing the word of life. 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy was his last epistle. The moment he finished writing, soon he was martyred for his faith. But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. Bear this in mind. Bear this in mind. And their word will eat as doth a canker, that is gangrene, of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus, a third individual. Alexander, now you have a new individual mentioned. Same uh, group of deadly individuals. Their teaching will eat you up like gangrene. You know what gangrene is, right? Turn uh, human flesh into rotten flesh. Words can do that. Of course, it's not literally your physical body. But imagine your understanding of Christ is now being eaten up by spiritual gangrene. The doctrine of the doctrine that you used to believe in and convicted in are beginning to change waver, eaten up. Well, you say, well, they have not been Paul's fellow laborers, not his friends before. Maybe that's why he mentioned them. They're not his students, co-laborers, co-workers. You may be right. These individuals, we are not told in anywhere that they were co-laborers of the Apostle Paul. Well, let me turn you to another passage. 2 Timothy 4.10 For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed unto Thessalonica. So beware of this person called Demas, because he became a lover of the world. Now you look at Philemon, Philemon has only one chapter, so Philemon chapter 1, only one chapter, verse 23. There salute thee, Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, Marcus, Aristarchus, Demas, Lucas, my what? Fellow laborers. So Demas was once upon a time serving, preaching, teaching, witnessing, evangelizing side by side with the great Apostle Paul. And then he changed. It must have broken Paul's heart to mock him and now to tell everyone otherwise 
before the Lord took him home. He wrote to Philemon, Demas was a good guy. My fellow laborer, we worked together. For him to be mentioned in this epistle means he was to be received, to be accepted. But then something happened. And so Paul had to now tell the church, beware of Demas, mock him. Paul did not tell us something in Romans 16 verse 17 that he himself did not practice, in other words. You see, marking someone, mentioning their name for the transgressions that they have committed because they kept on hurting the cause of Christ is not something that anyone should like to do. But it is something that we have to do. And it must be done with a heart that is saddened and broken. It's painful. Demas ate, prayed, served, with the Apostle Paul. Can't imagine you must have, what Paul must have gone through. Languishing in prison, cold, rat infested, dark, freezing, and to remember. Demas, my fellow laborer, has allowed the world to grip his heart and he has ceased to be faithful. And he had to warn everyone Beware of him. Whenever you have been serving with someone for many, many years, and then to see that person fall away by the wayside, for whether it is wrong doctrine, or whether it is because he has become a lover of the world, and then you have to mention him to warn others because some of you may still be influenced by him, is not something delightful it hurts it's painful but it has to be done always remember what the bible teaches us faithful are the wounds of a friend but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful and so if you are my friend from a bible god-centered perspective you see me do something wrong you see me backsliding please don't keep quiet Rebuke me, admonish me, please. Because very often when a person is in sin and backsliding, he can't see his own sin. And if you see it, don't pretend that all is well with my soul. Come to my house and laugh and have meals with me as if all is well. And you know all is not well. I want a friend like that. And if I refuse to repent, and I do things that are like these individuals cause divisions, scandalized because I teach other doctrines, and you keep quiet, you're not helping me. You know I am wrong, and you allow me to keep on propagating and wrong doctrine because you keep silent. But if you rebuke me, I may defend myself, I may try to justify, but I will thank you for caring for me enough to take that risk to incur my anger and my wrath against you. Because you care enough. You may not succeed. I may still go my own way stubbornly, holding on to my false teaching. But at least you can stand before your Lord Jesus Christ one day that you have tried. And my blood will not be on your head. But if you keep silent, if you don't mock me, and then you allow me to corrupt and ruin one by one, one family after another. You're not helping them. You're not helping me. You're definitely not helping the church and the cause of Christ. You have become a partaker of my transgression. Before you knew of my error, I committed this transgression. I stumbled five families. You are not held accountable for these five families because you were not aware. But once you are aware and then you keep silent and you did not try to stop me, then I confused and I stumble five more families, these five more families, you are also guilty of it. You know that, right? You know, when we were in FEBC, we had a course from an inspector, a policeman, teaching us some of the laws that we have to obey in Singapore. In Singapore, there is no such thing as when someone confessed their sins to you, this 
confession is private, where we are protected by the law not to divulge, that you see in some of these other countries. In Singapore, there's no such thing. And so he cited an example. If a man from your church or congregation, a member, comes to you and tells you that he has committed incense with his 14-year-old niece, that's criminal. You cannot keep quiet. The law says you have to report him to the police. And so if he comes to us, we have been taught. We will counsel him, check his salvation, and he is truly repentant. After everything, we pray with him. Now we have to tell him, let's go to the police station now. Immediately. No delay. I will go with you. Now you have to surrender yourself to the police and bear the consequences of your action. Whatever it is, and that will be the evidence of the sincerity of your repentance before God. Now let's say I keep quiet. The inspector tells us, all right, let's say you keep quiet. Confidentiality, whatever you want to call it. And then he committed incest again with the 16-year-old niece. Now that you have known, and then later on the police finds out that you knew earlier before he committed incest three more times. Those three times he committed incest, you're going to be guilty. We're going to hold you accountable. He ruined the life of his niece. That friend of yours, because you keep quiet, ruined the faith of five families, five souls. You think that is acceptable? That's why you have to mark them. Paul is not telling us something that he did not practice. It's always very painful after you try your best to tell this person, please, turn away from this error. Stop causing division. Stop your gossip. Stop your murmuring. Please, if you do not, then we have to do something. You know the five levels of church discipline. I'm not sure whether this is in your constitution. This is in Pandan's church constitution. We have to memorize it, and I hope you do too. Admonish, rebuke, that's the first two, where every session member is permitted to do on the spot. If anyone in the church create a ruckus, make too much noise or disturb the peace during worship or any church activities, any session member can go up to the person and pull the person aside, admonish and rebuke. And if you do not, suspend. If you serve in any capacity, suspend from service, suspend from Lord's Supper, and if you still refuse, deposition will remove you from your position. And then if you still refuse, remove you from membership. Five levels. For your sake. For the protection of the church. And above all else, to defend the honour of Jesus Christ. Because that's what a Christian is. We cannot let you continue to murmur and complain and spread division. Because now you are telling people that Jesus Christ is a what? He divides? Yes, in a way. Because Jesus Christ himself tells us, I did not come to bring peace. He told us that. Matthew 10. I come to bring variance, a division between father and son, mother and daughter, brother and sister, friend and friend, sometimes even husband and wife. Because of the truth, when someone becomes a Christian, your parents may not like it. And therefore, the peace that you once had in your home, a home that is based upon materialism or idolatry, whatever it is, that semblance of peace, which is false. And then now you become a Christian, the truth has now entered into this home. And so when the light of Christ begins to penetrate, darkness will recede. And that's where the variants come. We are not talking about that kind of truthful, Christ-honouring, God-honouring variance. Gossip is not the gospel. Gossip is very, very hurtful. Can't count the number of people who have left the church because of gossip. Person A tells person B, murmur about person C. Because he is angry with person C. Person B has no problem with person C until person A plant all these terrible thoughts into his mind. 
And now he's upset with person C. Over what? You just listen to person A because the person A is your buddy, your friend, your relative. And the worst part is they did it under the guise of Bible study. It becomes a nest of gossipers. That's why Bible study, please make sure you study the Bible. Make sure your Christian fellowship is truly Christian fellowship. And the moment you hear person A, people like person A trying to spread division, you've got to nip it in the bud and you tell the person, please stop it. Do you know that you have just done the deed of the devil? Because that's exactly what the devil is doing, sowing seeds of discord, which God hates according to Proverbs. And if you persist, people will have to mock you. We had someone who used to attend our church. He tried many times to be a member, but because he believed in the doctrine of annihilation, he doesn't believe in hell. He tried. We did not allow him. And so he started to send letters, documents to leaders of the church. I also received a number of them. Trying to argue and defend his case that hell doesn't exist. When a person dies, his soul just disappeared. Soul could be destroyed. Doctrine of annihilation, annihilated. We told him to stop. You send to leaders, fine, but enough. Please don't ever send to any church members. And then one day we received from a church member a document that he sent to them. Sent to him. We called him. You are not a member. We welcome you to worship with us. But if you do not stop, we have no choice but to warn every member by putting your name in the church bulletin. To mark you, to let everyone know not to have any communication with you and not to receive any more letters from you regarding this attack of the doctrine of the existence of hell. Thank God he left the church. Soon after that, he realized we have to protect God's people. We have to protect the honor and the name of Jesus Christ. It's our duty. That's what a Christian is supposed to do. Not just to share the gospel, but to earnestly contend for the faith once delivered unto the saints. Isn't that our duty and responsibility? So what is a Christian to you? This is the basis for the manner of separation. Mark them. And if you are not prepared to do that, ask yourself why. Why? Is it because that person is your friend, your relative, your buddy? That means you are very selfish. You don't really care for this, but you know the person is in sin, is in error, and is hurting the cause of Christ, and you keep your mouth shut because of some relationship or you're beholden or whatever it is. When it is not based upon truth, not based upon the love and care that you truly have the, for, for that person, you don't think in terms of eternity, you think in terms of your temporal moment of false peace. What kind of Christian are you would do that? So what is a Christian? To you. The Lord says he is someone who will mark anyone who called himself a Christian, who doesn't live the life of a Christian where he causes division and scandalize the faith of others by teaching wrong doctrines. You know what a BP church stands for. It's clearly stated in the Constitution and what is not mentioned in the Constitution is stated in the Westminster Confession of Faith. You know what it stands for. So honor it. Nobody forces anyone to believe in any doctrine which we can't. But when you are in a church with a constitution that is clearly described, honor it. Because a Christian would. Simply because this is the right ethical thing to do. You know, when we invite speakers from other denominations to speak in our church, we tell them, please do not mention these doctrines. We know that you do not agree with them, but this is our practice. In your preaching, in your messages, please avoid this doctrine. So the preacher said, okay. And then when our church members during the church camp went to his hotel room, and then they started to talk to him and ask him about those doctrines that he had been told not to mention, 
from the pulpit, but he mentioned to them privately in his hotel room. Soon enough, a year or two later, these members of ours, two of them were deacons. They created havoc in our church. An entire fellowship group just left the church. He caused a big rift in our congregation. Dishonorable individual. I mentioned his name, you probably would know him, but no need for me to mark him for you because you probably would not have anything to do with him. Another one from another denomination, he came. He pulled me aside. He was my lecturer, teacher in America. So on you, he says, I know that I do not have time to understand all your doctrines of Bible Presbyterianism. But if at any time during my sermons in the camp, I say anything that is contrary to what you have believed in in your church, let me know and I will correct myself on the spot from the pulpit. Honourable man. It's not about doctrine per se, isn't it? Because we know that we do not have perfect understanding. But the Lord knows. Different churches have different understanding. I'm not from your church. If I were to ever come to your church as a visitor, I have to honour your belief, even though in my heart I do not agree with it. It's not my conviction, but I'm a visitor. I honour it. I don't disturb the peace. When we were in America, we attended a Brethren Church, the most conservative within 10-minute drive. Because we don't know how to drive too far in winter. Winter is minus 20 degrees centigrade. Everywhere is white. Dangerous to drive. One, two hours to find the closest BP church. And so we understood their doctrine. They don't believe in infant baptism. We just worship. We keep quiet. We mind our own business. Because we know we are visitors. It's not right. We don't go around trying to convince them infant baptism is the way. Immersion is wrong and so on. We don't do that even though it's the right doctrine in our opinion. But it's not ethical as a Christian. So what about gossips? What about offences that will scandalise the faith of people? We don't force anyone to believe what they do not want to believe. But you know what we believe. Please honour it. And if others who believe it, and you know they do not agree with you, and you are from a different church, Sure, by all means. Tell the truth, but if you say no thank you, leave it as that. But if you keep on persisting like that friend who says annihilation is the way, hell is wrong. Dangerous. There is no salvation, you know that, right? You don't believe in hell, what gospel do you preach? You don't believe in Jesus Christ, you don't go to hell, you just psh, be nobody. You believe in Jesus Christ, you go to heaven. That's not the gospel of salvation according to scripture. A few months back, when I was in Chochukong Cemetery burying someone, I saw his gravestone. He's gone now. Whether he's in heaven or hell, I do not know. But I saw his gravestone after he left the church for many years. I interacted with him. I still recognize him. I remember his name. I was surprised to see his gravestone there. You have to mark them. And the Bible tells us the reason for separation, verse 18. For these individuals, they do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ. You know that, right? When they bring division the in the name of Jesus Christ, you have to know that they are not on the side of Christ. Only the devil would sow seeds of division and offense people, scandalize people in right doctrines. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ. You have to know that. You cannot be so naive to think that anyone who calls themselves Christian is a Christian. You must know by their action, by their own belly, self-serving. That's basically it. It's not just for their own food. But some of them, of course, they make merchandise of you, make money out of you. Charismatic pastors are number one at that. Making merchandise of the people who come to them. They are number one. 
you join the church, I was told that they want you to gyro your offering so that it is automatically deducted from your salary every month without fail. They make merchandise of you by their false teachings. And now we have individuals within our midst trying to scandalize and bring division. The best way to get people out of the church is to whisper and murmur against the leaders. You know that, right? You can't get along with this person, you don't mind staying in the church. But the moment you can't stand the leaders, the pastor in particular, you're sure to leave. And when they leave, where do they go? Is there any other sound biblical church out there that they can attend? No. You just simply ruined their faith. The only church that can help them grow in grace and the Lord Jesus Christ have now been so badly distorted because of your murmuring, your gossip. What you have just done, you serve your own belly. That means you serve carnality. How do you do it? Good words. You know what good words are, right? Words that will sound very good, sound convincing, but not biblical. As if the person is on your side and with their fair speeches, praise you and soft-spoken and make it so palatable, so convincing and make you feel good. They deceive the hearts of those who are simple. And a Christian is not supposed to be simple. They're supposed to be grounded in the Word of God. You're supposed to be wise as serpent, harmless as dove. You know all the tricks and all the nonsense and the snares of the evil one. But you don't do them. But you avoid them. Can you be so simplistic and so gullible? The devil will not send people into this church that will look like hippies. Because straight away, you all will not want to go near the person. He comes in with all kinds of funny behavior, whole face full of tattoo and dress in all kinds of strange garment. Doesn't dress like you, behave like you, talk like you. It will not work. The person will feel out of place. The person won't stay. So if the devil, the devil were to send someone into this church, wolves in sheep's clothing, he will look at all the sheep, what kind of clothing you wear. Short hair? All right, send short hair. Make sure you come in short hair. What else? Carry King James Bible. All right, make sure. Don't carry any other version. It won't succeed. King James Bible. What else? Talk like them. Use D and thou. You're D and thou, right? Now, when you pray, I make sure D and thou. Huh? If you don't pray D and thou, you're going to be caught. Okay? What else? Every outward image. Imitate. Follow. And so by their good words and their fair speeches, they worm themselves into your life, into your heart. Do you know that we have in FEBC one family from Korea? He came to our Bible college. And because it's a family, Dr. Ku asked me, is it okay for them to stay in our church? Sure, because FEBC doesn't have dormitories for families anymore. And so I said, sure, so he stayed in Pandan. I mean, we don't, know, we don't speak Korean. We don't know much about the Korean church life. But we have Korean friends, pastors who have graduated. And they told us, this family comes from a Korean church. You know, I don't know whether you heard of a Korean church at the start of the pandemic whereby they refused to divulge the names and the details and particulars of their church member to the authorities. That's the church. You know one of their methods? Send out families to fundamental Bible colleges. Study hard, graduate, and then send them to all these fundamental churches. And then you become the leader, and then slowly, little by little, you change their doctrines. And the whole church will now become mother church. It's their tactic. It's their strategy. They do that all the time. I didn't know that there are churches like this. Thank God he did not pass FEBC studies. He left. But we were on guard. We let them study, hopefully through the study of God, so they may be converted and become Christians. But there are individuals like this. 
So when the Bible speaks of wolves in sheep's clothing, it's not theory, it's real. It's real. They will come in, they will slip in, good words and fair speeches, they will ruin you. They will deceive you. If you are simple-minded, you allow your heart and not your head to control you, you will fall. You will fall. We have disciplined some leaders before, and some of them left the church because we disciplined these leaders. And these leaders are their close friends and their buddies. Sad, tragic, but that's what happened. When you allow your feelings and your emotions to have the dominant controlling factor in your decision making, it's only a matter of time when you're going to make mistakes. You have to make it based upon your understanding of God's word. Don't be simple-minded. The only way that you can be wise unto the Lord is to know the word of God well so that you evaluate people, evaluate circumstances according to Holy Scriptures. And then you always decide that will promote the Lord Jesus Christ. You are a Christian left behind to spread the gospel and to defend the honour of your Lord Jesus Christ. Don't ever forget that. And if you keep quiet and you leave things be, you are not doing Jesus any favour. In fact, you become a partaker of transgression of that person that you want to take your side with. Take his side. Do you realise that? Biblical separation is the most important doctrine for every believer when it comes to the protection of your spiritual well-being. You practice it for your personal protection and you practice it for your church's protection. And if you don't do it, nobody else would because it involves every one of you. The leaders can preach and teach all you and the leaders may say, well, so-and-so is now excommunicated because of this doctrine. And then you go and invite him to your house. That's it. You know what excommunication means, right? Because if the person is truly born again and you cut him off from Christian fellowship, he will feel so miserable that he will want to repent and come back to the Lord. That's the purpose of excommunication. It is not meant to be hurtful. When Paul says, mark them, it is also to help them. Let them know the serious nature of their transgression. When you befriend them knowing that they are wrong, they will continue in their error and they're going to die in sin, die in their error and end up in hell. That's what Paul says, mark them, let them know the serious nature of their transgression so that they will stop sinning. And perhaps while they're still alive, they can return to the Lord before they die. That's the purpose. Because they are doing it for their own belly, for some personal gain. Whatever it is, it's belly means some personal, materialistic, carnal agenda. And you are not helping that person. You truly love that person. You have to stop that person. You have to stop them. And you know the worst part is these persons, per persons sometimes may think they're doing it also for the glory of God. That's the scary part. You know, those people who believe and defend the doctrine, the Bible has mistakes, you ask them, they truly believe sincerely that they are doing it for God's glory. You know that, right? You are doing it for God's glory, defending the Bible is perfect. They are doing it for God's glory, defending the Bible has mistakes. Who is right? Somebody's got to be right. Somebody's got to be wrong. And you know what the Bible says. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. Not one jot and tittle of my word will ever pass away, even when heaven and earth passeth away. So the word of God is clear. Is the Bible perfect or not? If it is, but they also believe that they're doing God's will. You think Jesus didn't know? Jesus already knew. John 16, verse 12. So John 16, verse 1 and verse 2. You see what the Lord said to the disciples. John 16, verse 1. These things have I spoken unto you that you should not be stumbled, scandalized. They shall put you out of the synagogues. That means the moment you become Christians and you promote Christ, Bear in mind that you're going to be ostracized because to the Jews, attending synagogue is part and parcel of their life. And to be put out is to be ostracized, excommunicated, and it is very, very lonely. 
when the whole township, everyone in the Jewish community know that you have been taken out of the synagogue, it's painful. And your family will also suffer with you. Put you out of the synagogue. Yea, the time cometh that whosoever killeth you might think that they doeth God's service. You see that? The Pharisees, when you study the book of Acts, when they put Peter into prison, when they mobilized the mob and stoned Stephen to death, with Saul, the young man standing there, holding onto the garments as they stoned him to death, they all believed that they are doing God a big favor. When they shouted, crucify Christ, crucify him, they thought that they were doing God a big favor too. That's the cunning nature of the devil. It's diabolical. People doing the work of the devil, they don't even know it. They think they're doing the work of Christ. And you know, most of the time, the victims and casualties will be all of you in the pew. The ones who are the least knowledgeable in God's word are the ones who will be the easiest to deceive, to fall away. Those who are sound and those who are not simplistic, they will be able to discern and they will understand. But those who are not, you are always in peril. That's why your pastor understands the importance of preaching, teaching, preaching, teaching the Word of God because the Word of God is the most powerful weapon on earth because the more you know God's Word, the more your mind of Christ will be filled with the knowledge of God. And the more you're filled with the knowledge of God, that knowledge is the knowledge of the Creator, not even the cunning devices of the devil who is still a creature will be wiser than you. You want to use your IQ, you think you're going to be cleverer than the devil who has for thousands of years of manipulation and deception. He's known as the father of lies. That means every form of lying and deception, he origin originated them. And you think you are going to see through him without the word of God? Impossible. But once you have the mind of Christ, which God gave to every believer, then you study the word of God, then you can now fill it with the knowledge of God, you will now not become so easily a victim of the devil. Deceive the hearts of the simple. You need to think with your mind and put aside your emotion for the moment and see for yourself by taking my side, the side with my son, am I helping him in terms of heaven and hell? If I take the side of my daughter, my husband, my wife, am I helping them in terms of heaven and hell? If I'm not helping them, then I have to tell them, this is wrong, my son, please repent. Pastor is right, you are wrong. The word of God is right. Please stop it. Dad cannot be on your side because dad loves you. That's what dad has to tell you. And by taking your side, I'm not helping you, I'm hurting you. I'm thinking in terms of eternity, you go this way, you will end up in hell. Please understand, because a child of God will not bring division. A child of God will not scandalize the truth that is in God's people's life. You have to tell them. And then the result, verse 19 and verse 20. For your obedience is come abroad unto all men. They stood the test. They remained steadfast, unmovable, abounding in the work of the Lord. And their obedience to what Paul taught them had encouraged others. I am glad therefore on your behalf what you have done. But something more I need to emphasize. Your testimony is good enough. Your obedience is wonderful. But something more. Yet I would have you wise unto that which is good and simple concerning evil. What Paul meant is simply this. When you take the side of someone who is erroneous, you are now beginning to taste and experience more and more evil. And Paul says, when it comes to the things of evil, you should be like a child with as little experience as possible in things evil and wicked and sinful. But when you take the side of people who are malicious, who are divisive and who are offensive, you will experience more and more of this transgression together with them. But in terms of good words, doctrines, you be a man, you be wise. You should know more and more of things that are good, holy, righteous, godly. Scripture. Those things you must know more and more and have more experiences of things that are Christ-centered. But things that are evil and wicked, you stay as far away as possible. You don't want to know all these things experientially speaking. Please understand this. He's talking about experience. And if you 
hang around with these people, guarantee your evil experience will go up. You hang around with godly people, guarantee godly experiences will go up. So your choice. You don't separate, you want to join them, you're going to face it. Sadly, tragically, we have members who tell us that they are more comfortable with their friends who are carnal, who are non-Christians, than with Christian friends. That is a very dangerous testimony to confess. How could you feel more comfortable with the children of the devil and you feel uncomfortable with the children of God in church? Because in heaven, you're not going to find a single child of the devil, right? So what, you're going to be very uncomfortable in heaven? So the problem is not the external problem, it's you, isn't it? The problem is you. Why are you uncomfortable when you are with Christians who talk about Christian things? And you're comfortable with the people of the world who talks about carnal things. That is something wrong with your heart. Seriously. You're experiencing more and more carnal things and you what? You like it? You're experiencing holy things and you find it distasteful? There is something seriously wrong with your soul. You have to make sure that you are truly born again in Christ. Biblical separation is something that you must do. Even though it is not commanded, it is to be besought. That means Paul says, please do it willingly because it is for your own good and for the cause of Christ and also for the good of your fellow believers. In the church, it's everyone's responsibility. The unity and the harmony and the peace in the church is everyone's responsibility. If person A wants to murmur against person C and if B tell the person to stop it, then B and C will still be on good terms. And if B allow A to continue and murmur and complain, then he is not encouraging him to go to the next person and next person and next person. The only way to stop it is to tell the person, please, you have something against C, go to person C directly. What you are doing is sinful and you have to stop. If you do not stop, I will have to let pastor know. Mark him to help him too. Please understand it. Do it with the right heart. Help him because this person is now going around causing the same thing again and again and again. Help him. And if you join him, be careful, you're no longer going to be simple concerning evil. You're going to be very mature. And the Lord says, don't do that. Don't let that happen. Because evil experiences will haunt you for a long, long time to come. So commit as few sins as possible so that you will have few memories of sinful behavior and sinful conduct. But in terms of things that are holy, godly, and righteous, have as many of them as possible. That's what Paul says. I want you to do that. And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. Now this is something that is like a conundrum, isn't it? How could the God of peace, where the emphasis is on his peace, peaceful nature. Now you know God has many attributes, right? But then the apostle Paul says the God of peace and then what will, he, what will he do? He will bruise Satan. The word bruise there means to crush him completely, break him to pieces, destroy him permanently. Why would the God of peace do this? He should be the God of holiness, right? But God purposely used the attribute God of peace to crush Satan under your feet shortly, as soon as possible. Now, we know in Hebrews chapter 2 that when Jesus Christ took on flesh and blood, that means he came to destroy the devil who has the power over death. Now, that is done. And because the construction here is shall bruise, that means it's future. So he's not referring to that passage in Hebrews 2 by his act on the cross, by his crucifixion, by his death, by his resurrection. He has really destroyed the devil. Now, that is another sermon in itself. He destroyed the devil. Which part? Which aspect? Well, that aspect that we just simply summarized for you. That aspect of his, that is to make sure that no human being will be found in heaven. 
that aspect, Jesus Christ came and destroyed the devil's work in that sense. Because now in Christ, we can go to heaven. Without Christ, we cannot go to heaven. Now that aspect, God has destroyed what the devil has done to all of us. But that's past. It's already done. But this is future. So therefore, it cannot refer to that incident referring to his cross at Calvary. So this has to refer to something else. The God of peace referring to what you are doing by, practic by practicing biblical separation is a peaceful act. It's a peaceful thing. God's peace, not the kind of peace that sacrifices truth. Not the kind of peace that sacrifices holiness and godliness. That kind of peace is false. That's why the world doesn't have it. What the world, when they talk about peace, is basically truth, not real peace. All of them are rearming themselves, updating all the military hardware, and so that's not peace. What you are doing is peace from God. Helping the person to come to the saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't that the wonderful peace? Helping this sinner to make peace with God in Christ by what you are doing, by practicing biblical separation, by highlighting his sin, by marking his transgression, to help him to stop his sin and turn to Christ. So don't ever think that practice of biblical separation is not a peaceful doctrine. God says it is. That's why he describes himself here in this context as the God of peace and he shall destroy the devil under your feet shortly, the works of the devil. And he is going to cast him into the lake of fire one day. That means all those who deceive people, sow division and bring offences, they are doing the work of the devil. God says, I'm going to crush the devil and when he is crushed, all these works and all these will follow, will be destroyed as well. So don't you do the work of the devil by sowing seeds of discord and bringing offences, scandalised doctrine that will stumble people, bring offence to them and scandalise their faith. And beware, they are going to use their smooth words, praising you, trying to be your friend, to work into your life. But make sure your heart is not simple. Because if you are, you're going to be a victim, a casualty. And the worst part is, you think you are right. That's how cunning the devil is. Make you do his work and his will, but at the same time, you think you're doing God's will. The only way that you will not fall into that snare is to know God's word. That you are not doing God's work by what you are doing because it is not according to scripture. And the more you know scripture, the wiser you get. The safer you are. So parents, you keep your family safe. You better know scripture, especially the head of every home. Wives, you are supposed to be the helpmeet. Help your husband by ensuring and encouraging them to study God's word regularly. Because if they don't, your family can become a victim. Because these individuals, they use good words and fair speeches. Praise you sky high, very warm, very nice, invite you to their home, you invite them to their home and so on, and that's how they will begin. Someone joined our church. He invited my family to his beautiful multi-million dollar condominium in Orchard Road. Later on, I found out that he invited leaders one by one. You know what he was doing? Studying us. Studying each and every leader to see which one he could make use of for his own personal gain. And so when we were there, good words and fair speeches literally were used. Thank God he did not succeed. He nearly did. He nearly did. He watched and see who were the elders that he could attach himself to and then toy with them. He's a multimillionaire, very rich. And so he used his wealth, used his nice behavior, dressed like all of us in Pandan. You look at him, always a smile on his face, very soft-spoken, very deadly and cunning. Extremely. And his whole life is one of manipulation. See who he can manipulate and win over for his own personal gain and agenda where the God that he worships is his own belly, himself, his pride, his ego. He nearly succeeded. He nearly became one of the leaders in our 
session. But the mercies and grace of God, he failed. And when he failed, he called me up and he gave me a harsh scolding. But he always appeared very soft-spoken. And so if I were to report him to the leaders, and then he said, no, I never did that. Reverend Gray is the one who raised his voice and scolded me. They will probably believe him because I always raise my voice and scold people. <laughs> you see? Very cunning on the surface because phone call, he can say whatever he wants because it's his word against mine and on my phone doesn't have any automatic tape recorder. Very cunning. Very deadly and dangerous. There are people who are like that. The warning is real. And in the last days, all the more you should be extra careful. And here, you know, sound churches are rarer than diamonds. And if someone duped you and you leave, where are you going to go? Where are your children going to go? If you do not do your part and sustain and protect what you have, and you do not know how precious what you have is here. Don't lose it. After you lost it, then you want to cherish it and value it. It's too late. Be grateful, be thankful by doing your part and your utmost. Don't let anyone sow seeds of discord. Know the doctrines well. Hold on to it. Defend it. Because what is a Christian? He is a child of God, left behind by your heavenly Father to be a holy witness for Christ, so that by your life, they should not see you. They should see Christ. That is who you are. That's what a Christian is. You practice biblical separation for Jesus' sake, first and foremost, and then to help others who have strayed away. Don't ever forget that. Think in terms of eternity and not your temporal friendship and relationship. Because if you can't see eternity, heaven or hell, by helping him, he's going to hell. You're going to help him more to hell or to awaken him by practicing biblical separation and save his soul. Or are you so selfish? Turn a blind eye, don't see anything and maintain some semblance of peace for 10, 20 years and then when he dies, he ends up in hell. When you die, you go to heaven, you can live with that. May God help us. Let us pray. What do we have here? Top five reasons why church dropouts, uh, what church dropouts say, why they stop attending church. Now, please remember 66% of, well, I take the American view, um, they are the most readily available results. They stop attending church at least a year after turning 18. So from